Carol Allen is retired from Ford Church. She was uh, associate pastor for congregational care. And one of the things she did was look after our care teams and helping our members who were involved in the call process in seminary, helping them in their preparation for ministry. She's also served in other variety of church settings, including the Common Theological Seminary, and now she's working in the areas of spiritual direction and adult education. So with that, I'm going to give a quick prayer, if you'll all bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious God, be with us today. Help us to hear what you would have us hear. Help us to think about our own stories, as other stories are shared, so that we might gain some insights into how those narratives affect our lives and affect our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, it's very good to be back on Fourth Presbyterian Church soil. And with those who are here and those of you on the screen at home, welcome everyone. And in the next two weeks, we will have some additional storytellers join us, Arlene Falk next week and Jim Garner the week after that. But my grateful thanks to Alan Bath and Cynthia Johnson, who co-chair the Adult Ed Committee and Stephanie Schumann, who is the admin for the committee and has done no person's work setting this up, and also now Fred Hickler, who is the expert on technology and other things, and we're grateful for all of them and for those who helped, in addition to them, to set up this space for us. I want to say briefly how this class came about. Um, it began with an invitation from the committee back in March by way of Polly Peters, who works with spiritual formation initiatives of the committee, as I understand it. And she asked me to consider a class I would like to offer the congregation. And I decided a focus on listening for the sound of the genuine in ourselves, in the other, and between us through the power of storytelling would be the focus. And I hope as we go along in these four weeks to illustrate how our cultures, languages, power relationships, and the dominant behavioral norms and values influence the stories we tell and hear as we go along in making sense of our lives and defining who we are. At times, these stories we hear and tell can be harmful to us. But together we can make revisions that will help in our healing. We're going to watch a video a bit later on that's been around for a while, but it, it helps to make this point. Um, the focus of our time in these four weeks will be to practice one particular approach to storytelling that will help us frame when we tell our own stories and that our two guests, Arlene and Jim, will be using when they tell their life stories. So if it's handy to you, you could get just a piece of paper and a pencil at this point and just have it handy for yourself. Um, I believe you have in front of you the resource list or it has been sent to you, and that uh, needs a correction. I goofed when putting Howard Thurman's dates on. I made him much older than he actually is. <laughs> His dates are really 1900 to 1981. The Sound of the Genuine comes from Howard Thurman's address to Spelman College Baccalaureates a couple of years before his death. And there's a quote on the resource sheet uh, that I draw your attention to. There is in every person that, <clears throat> that which waits, 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 and listens for the sound of the genuine in herself. There is that in every person that waits, waits, and listens for the sound of the genuine in other people. 
And when these two sounds come together, this is the music that God heard when God said, let us make humankind in our image. We're going to explore what that might mean and whether we might have an experience of that during this four weeks. Let me set the stage a bit further. Toward the end of summer last year, I was sitting in my glider rocker, coffee cup in hand, looking south down State Street from my living room window, listening to the sounds of my neighborhood waking up to a new day. With fewer years before me now than behind me, I'm often in that chair in the early morning. And this thought just came unbidden through my mind. Old age is a time to put yourself in context. Those words startled me and set me to pondering. Do you ever think how amazing it is we just show up on the planet? We had no say over when, where, how, to whom we showed up. And then we go from there to weave of the gift of our life what we can, as long as we can. And we don't do the weaving alone. We have tears and repairs to illustrate our experiences in the companies of others along the way who are engaged in their own weaving work and in the work we do together. Storytelling is one metaphor for this weaving work. And I've been working with a group of people from the round of the world trying to figure what this means all of this year. And I learned that one way to reflect on our life's context is to start by drawing a tree. Here's the one I drew. It's a rather poor facsimile of a Norfolk pine, a semi-tropical plant that has grown well in my living room. In fact, a couple of years ago, I had a virtual forest of Norfolk pines, and I adopted them out because they were beginning to take over my living room. A um, the invitation to use tree drawings to tell our life stories can be found in the work of N. Zello and Kube, who is a child and community counselor who created some years ago, it's on your resource list, a tree of life project as an aid to the healing of children who had been orphaned by HIV AIDS and the revitalization of their stretched, stressed out cheer, caregivers who were living in a Christian based organization run camp in Zimbabwe. Arlene and Jim will be using this framework to tell their life stories, and we're going to start our own today. We won't have a lot of time to do that, but we'll have more time in the next weeks. I'm going to begin with just some anecdotes about the roots of my tree. You'll see on your handout an outline of the tree and questions to ask yourself about each part of that tree. And I'm going to start with the roots of my tree. We're invited in that section to draw, to jot down names of significant figures from our ancestry and our family of origin, those who taught us a lot, maybe the most, and a favorite song or dance that we remember. While I share snippets of my story, you may remember some of your own and jot them down in order the, to add them to your tree later on. Now, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s in the American Midwest. I remember the first president was Dwight D. Eisenhower, and I could vote for the first time for John F. Kennedy. Now, I noted three people on my tree, my father, Albert Clyde Allen, my paternal grandfather, Friedrich Wilhelm Nickel, and a Presbyterian minister named Henry Shepherd Date. 
I could name others from my origins and history, but we'll focus on just these three for now. I learned my dad ran away from an abusive age, uh, abusive home at an early age. And after a stint in the Navy and an attempt at civilian life in law enforcement, he became a career non-commissioned officer in the U.S. Army. And in stories told by his peers, it was in the Army that he found identity, purpose, meaning, affirmation, and that he had abilities to make positive things happen. During my childhood, our family moved with him to Kansas, Kentucky, and Maryland to live on or near military bases. Now, there were downsides, a lot of them, in being uprooted in the middle of school years and great pain over the loss of my father when I was 15 when my mother divorced him and he left town. But I learned how much bigger the world is than the one I had known and that it's possible to cope with a variety of kinds of people and to learn from differing landscapes. I have three favorite memories of Albert Clyde, my dad, sitting on his lamp, lap, drinking from his coffee cup that he had sweetened with milk and sugar, and holding on to me with arms that smelled like the sun. The nickname he gave me, Fuzzy, because my hair was always going every which way and was very fine. And a picture of him in an army uniform sitting on a long couch, my brother two years younger, sitting on one side and me on the other, leaning into him and all three of us have our nose in a book. That was pretty customary, reading or playing Monopoly. Now, lots more I could add about my meeting up with him again in my 20s and gaining some understanding of how my parents just couldn't agree on how and where to live and why he left and how the rift in my family affected my life. But for now, I'm going to move on to my maternal grandfather. I'm told that his grandparents fled from war in Europe from their home in Magdeburg, Germany to Alsace-Lorraine and on to the U.S. through Ellis Island. Some of them took up farming, but my grandpa Fred chose to live in the city. He got as far as the eighth grade in a Lutheran parochial school, did some lumberjacking in Upper Michigan, owned and lost property during a time of depression, economic depression, became ultimately a minor league baseball player, and later, when I showed up, was working as a night watchman at the Rio Motor Plant in the south end of Lansing, Michigan, where I was born. His firstborn, a son, was killed in the war, and it was a sacred occasion to pull out shards from a wine bottle that my grandmother had used to christen a battleship in his honor and to remember stories from the uncle's youth, an uncle I never knew. Now, I was the first child of my grandfather's youngest daughter, and I came into being three weeks early, weighing less than four pounds, and I spent my first month in a box in a hospital. Now, Grandpa Fred was six foot seven, and he looked like a giant to me, and he bragged about taking me to the bowling alley to meet his friends who called him, hi, nickel, and he said I was small enough he could hold me in the palm of a hand. It was a challenge to keep up with him in our walks. He taught me to play catch, set up a bowling lane in the basement and taught me how to roll a bowling ball, and set up a table there that where later in college I could practice dissecting techniques for my science class. He taught me to count in German, introduced me to German cooking, and at our regular Sunday morning, a uh, Sunday noon family dinners, fueled my desire to go on beyond him in school and to get out of my hometown and see the world. I never heard him say an unkind word about anyone. 
people seemed to like him, except I remember he said, don't you go near those Polish Catholics that live across the street, you know. They believe in a pope who's out to take over the world. Well, that motivated me to certainly learn about other religions along the way. So I was the first to finish high school and get on to college and to pursue a profession. And Grandpa Fred kept interested in what I was doing and support of me all along the way. For years, going bowling and sitting for meals at round wooden tables helped me feel close to him. When I first moved to Chicago without a circle of friends yet, I would take myself to the Berghof for a, ger a German lunch to celebrate my birthday. Finally, last story. Henry Date, Henry Shepherd Date, fresh out of seminary and new pastor of the Mount Hope Presbyterian Church within walking distance of where our family lived with my mother's parents after my parents divorced. They wrapped the arms of the congregation around us and gave us a safe and nurturing place to belong. He trusted me to care for his children. His wife answered questions I had about growing up, my changing body, having babies that my parents were a bit hard pressed to talk about with me. And one day, he put me to work doing a Sunday youth sermon. He introduced Youth Sundays to the congregation. And then he put me to work discussing, reading, discussing Bible studies to fourth and fifth graders. There's only a handful of them in that small congregation. But their energy and imagination just light me up still to this day. Now, Reverend Date organized the few of us teenagers into a group and would take us on field trips to various colleges, challenging us to think how we might go on to school. And he challenged us often with this question, how are you going to give thanks for the life you've been given? How are you going to give thanks? Well, two of my favorite hymns in those years were Be Thou My Vision and For the Beauty of the Earth. I loved country western music, sneaking true confession magazines into my bed, trying to figure what, out what went on between male and female adults. And I loved doing the hokey pokey. Do any of you remember the hokey pokey? I think I learned it at a conference of church youth one summer in a college setting. Hokey pokey has to do with in a big circle and putting various potty, body parts into the circle and out of the circle and shaking all about and do the hokey pokey. Now, if you can listen to the stories, <clears throat> pardon me, you're going to hear, try to take yourself out of the roles you play every day and just hear from your heart, your body, your mind without acting from within the role you normally play. And does anyone want to respond to what I shared that strikes a chord in you? Maybe something of what you heard suggests something about what I have given my life to in commitments, perhaps? And what is there in your own life and work that maybe account for how you respond? Would, would any of you like to respond to that? It's okay if you don't, but if you do, I'd be pleased to hear. Can you repeat what you said? Repeat the questions? Uh, yeah, we're not sure, I think. Oh, oh, if there is anything I said that struck a chord with you and why that might have struck a chord with you in your own life and work. <laughs> For me, it was the, you know, what are you going to do to show thanks for this gift of life that you've been given? It's kind of a feeling of mine that, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. <laughs> it's kind of what I try to live my life by. So that really struck the code with me. So that's what connected for you. Yeah. Um, one of the 
one thing that really resonated with me was I heard my parents' stories too, and stories of my grandparents. Uh, and I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, ah! <laughs> so it was a little, um, and just, you know, even we went camping and sitting around the campfire and telling stories, and then, you know, Girl Scouts, or then, you know, then I became a journalist finally to listen to other people's stories, so. They're just, stories are really great. And that, and I, I'd like to, us to go to the video now, and we'll have a chance to discuss that and say a little more about your own roots. Um, it's a Nigerian author, an award-winning author, who some of you may have seen the video. It's been around. I learned about it in this class on narrative as a metaphor for telling our life story. And um, the, po the danger of a single story. Let's see what sense it makes to us. I'm a storyteller, and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <clears throat> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. Now, this despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, I had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. And for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer but that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books, by their very nature, had to have foreigners in them, and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now, things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available, and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laye, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read, they stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. 
And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago, in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. <laughs> so after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West, a tradition of sub-Saharan Africa as a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet, <coughs> Rudyard Kipling, are half devil, half child. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have, throughout her life, seen and heard different versions of this single story. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places, but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle-class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that I, too, am just as guilty on the question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US. The political climate in the US at the time was tense, and there were debates going on about immigration. And as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were 
fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans, and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. So that is how to create a single story, show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is nkale. It's a noun that loosely translates to to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of nkale. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Murid Baghouti writes that if you want to dispossess a people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. Start the story with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British, and you have an entirely different story. Start the story with the failure of the African state, and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. I recently spoke at a university where a student told me that it was such a shame that Nigerian men were, were <coughs> physical abusers like the father character in my novel. I told him that I had just read a novel called American Psycho. <laughs> and, and that it was such a shame that young Americans were serial murderers. <laughs> now, 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 obviously, I said this in a fit of mild irritation, but <laughs> it would never have occurred to me to think that just because I had read a novel in which a character was a serial killer, that he was somehow representative of all Americans. And now, this is not because I'm a better person than that student, but because of America's cultural and economic power, I had many stories of America. I had read Thailand, Updike, and Steinberg, and Gateskill. I did not have a single story of America. When I learned some years ago that writers were expected to have had really unhappy childhoods to be successful, I began to think about how I could invent horrible things my parents had done to me. <laughs> but the truth is that I had a very happy childhood, full of laughter and love in a very close-knit family. But I also had grandfathers who died in refugee camps. My cousin, Polly, died because he could not get adequate health care. One of my closest friends, Ukuloma, died in a plane crash because our fire trucks did not have water. I grew up under repressive military governments that devalued education so that sometimes my parents were not paid their salaries. And so as a child, I saw jam disappear from the breakfast table. Then margarine disappeared. Then bread became too expensive. Then milk became rationed. And most of all, a kind of normalized political fear invaded our lives. All of these stories make me who I am. But to insist on only these negative stories is to flatten my experience and to overlook the many other stories that formed me. The single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Of course, Africa is a continent full of catastrophes, the immense ones such as the horrific rapes in Congo and depressing ones such as the fact that 5,000 people apply for one job vacancy in Nigeria. But there are other stories that are not about catastrophe, and it is very important, it is just as important to talk about them 
I've always felt that it is impossible to engage properly with a place or a person without engaging with all of the stories of that place and that person. The consequence of the single story is this, it robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. So what if before my Mexican trip, I had followed the immigration debate from both sides, the US and the Mexican? What if my mother had told us that Fide's family was poor and had walking? What if we had an African television network that broadcast diverse African stories all over the world, what the Nigerian writer Chino Achebe calls a balance of stories? What if my roommate knew about my Nigerian publisher, Mukta Bakari, a remarkable man who left his job in a bank to follow his dream and start a publishing house? Now, the conventional wisdom was that Nigerians don't read literature. He disagreed. He felt that people who could read would read if you made literature affordable and available to them. Shortly after he published my first novel, I went to a TV station in Lagos to do an interview. And a woman who walked there as a messenger came up to me and said, I really liked your novel. I didn't like the ending. Now you must write a sequel, and this is what will happen. <laughs> and she went on to tell me what to write in the sequel. Now, I was not only charmed, I was very moved. Here was a woman, part of the ordinary masses of Nigerians who were not supposed to be readers. She had not only read the book, but she had taken ownership of it and felt justified in telling me what to write in the sequel. Now, what if my roommate knew about my friend, Fumi Yonda, a fearless woman who hosts a TV show in Lagos and is determined to tell the stories that we prefer to forget? What if my roommate knew about the heart procedure that was performed in the Lagos hospital last week? What if my roommate knew about contemporary Nigerian music, talented people singing in English and Pidgin and Igbo and Yoruba and Ijo, mixing influences from Jay-Z to Fela to Bob Marley to their grandfathers? What if my roommate knew about the female lawyer who recently went to court in Nigeria to challenge a ridiculous law that required women to get their husband's consent before renewing their passports? What if my roommate knew about Nollywood, full of innovative people making films despite great technical odds, films so popular that they really are the best example of Nigerians consuming what they produce? What if my roommate knew about my wonderfully ambitious hair braider who has just started her own business selling hair extensions? Or about the millions of other Nigerians who start businesses and sometimes fail, but continue to nurse ambition? Every time I am home, I am confronted with the usual sources of irritation for most Nigerians, our failed infrastructure, our failed government, but also by the incredible resilience of people who thrive despite the government rather than because of it. I teach writing workshops in Lagos every summer, and it is amazing to me how many people apply, how many people are eager to write, to tell stories. My Nigerian publisher and I have just started a nonprofit called Farafina Trust, and we have big dreams of building libraries and refurbishing libraries that already exist, and providing books for state schools that don't have anything in their libraries, and also of organizing lots and lots of workshops on reading and writing for all the people who are eager to tell our many stories. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. The American writer Alice Walker wrote this about um, her southern relatives who had moved to the north, and she introduced them to a book about the southern life that they had left behind. They sat around reading the book themselves, listening to me read the book, and the kind of paradise was regained. I would like to end with this thought, that when we reject the single story, when we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. Thank you. Ah, 
Ms. Adichie, the power, the danger of a single story. A TED Talk that you could listen to again. Uh, it was made in 2009. She's written some wonderful stories, novels, award-winning literature since. I wonder, this is a bit of an awkward way to try to talk to each other, but I wonder in the few minutes we have left if as you listen to her talk, what kind of images did her words evoke in you? And what did she suggest to you about what her purpose and commitments are, what she values and hopes for? These are questions to ask yourself as you listen to people's stories. And if there was something in your own life and work that accounts for why those particular images or words caught your attention, struck a chord, something in your own experience that resonates or associates you with them. And is there something that you have been moved in a way that you would not have been moved had you not heard Ms. Adichie speak today? Can you repeat the last sentence she said at, at the end? She said, I want to say the final thing she said. What did she say? Can, you, can somebody repeat it? Oh, you're talking about in the video? Yeah, when she, at the very end, she said, Basic synopsis of it was, you know, don't reach for just the same story. There's always that second or third or fourth narrative for a specific okay, place so, or culture so that will help you get a complete picture. That's right. That and she used the word paradise. That's right. Paradise. And, and that that would be the paradise. I love the part about the roommate. I just could. <laughs> I'm sure I've fallen into that trap somewhere along the way. I have to have a tortured, you know, childhood to be an actual author, which that is a paradigm you kind of have in your head. So I don't, don't, I didn't find a connection to my own life, except we do tend to feel, you know, we had an ordinary upbringing, therefore, you know, we're not going to have a great impact on the world. But that's really not true. Your impact upbringing does not impact what level of impact you can have. Does it give you a sense of how some stories become dominant, that there's a power relation with stories that get told and their meaning? And this is a real challenge, I think, in this course I've been taking with people around the world this year, actually from Russia, from the Ukraine, from all over the US, from British Columbia, with, through the magic of Zooming, Think about what multiculturalism means. We might think we arrive at multiculturalism, and that's a real place to arrive at. But think about cultural democracy. Weigh those two. See what you think of the, what might be the difference. Uh, you know, um, I said someone one time, um, uh, how can I say this? I said, why do you stay in this particular organization as a black person? She said, well, I stay because it has commitments to social justice, but we are so polite to each other. Are we ever going to be ourselves with each other? Well, I don't know all of what that means. That's something, I'm sorry, folks, that's something to, to explore with her further. But it's get at, you know, we can sit beside each other in the chair, but is that the end? goal that we have in light of what Ms. Adichie is talking about. And I can't claim to have it all worked out, but I thought it was a good challenge to lay on ourselves today. And next week, Arlene Falk will be here and use the tree image to tell her life story, and then Jim Garner. And during this week, 
draw a tree and start with your roots. You have, uh, you have the outline for what to add to your roots. You heard something of my own. Um, start your own tree and we'll work our way through it in the next four weeks. Any other last things that got evoked in you? Well, I was thinking about um, my first year in college. Um, there wasn't enough room, so we were in a house, and there was um, a black young woman from the South who was majoring in science, and a New York Jewish woman, I never quite knew what she was majoring in, and me from the Midwest. And I can remember some awkward moments, like um, Mary, my black friend, would straighten her hair because they didn't have all these products that we have now for black hair. And <laughs> The Jewish woman would say, it smells like burned hair in here. And how stressed out I felt uh, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Moments to learn from and to tell our stories from that help others connect in their own way. Any other comments on what you've heard or seen today that struck a chord and why that might have been so? I think I'll add one thing. The Mary, the woman from the South, taught me all the spirituals. Ah. And we used to sing them in harmony. Mm -hmm. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Well, we've started. Draw your tree. <laughs> Start with your roots. Go to your trunk. Go to your branches. See what fruit is on your tree. My fruit and my Norfolk pine are little new starts of growth. And on your list, there's a talk about bugs. Yeah. There are bugs that get into our trees <laughs> and challenges that we have to face and how we face them. And then the ground we're standing on right now and what our everyday life is like. There's tons of stories to tell. And I hope you hear did you hear the sound of the genuine in Ms. Adichie's? Yeah. Something that hit ground foundation somehow. One other way I'd like to challenge you because it just, uh, last week in our class we spent all oh, the weekend talking about colonialization. But the point of bringing that up is that in my small study group we talked about for church people, we colonialize images of God. And we say, well, we can reform images, but that's not the same as delinking whiteness from images of God, for example. Do you see the difference? We can make room, or, <laughs> or we can really make room from, from, an, from a kind of shared or equitable stance versus top down. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one, one quick announcement. We will um, go to Borwell next week. Okay. So same uh, Zoom channel, but we'll go in person in Borwell. Okay? Okay. Great. Thank, thank you at home. Thank you, Carol.